How's everybody doing? How are the Albrights? Good? A live awake alert enthusiastic? Okay. Hey, believe it or not, we're week five of five, okay? This Sunday is Palm Sunday. We enter Holy Week. And so this is our final uh, lecture of our Lenten lecture series, the culmination, uh, the capstone. We got our lead pastor. I'll tell you what, lead pastor taking out time to come here three nights in a row leading up to Easter. You don't have anything else going on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here tonight. If you are wondering how you can serve the body, serve the larger community as light and life for the city, be aware that there are many volunteer needs around Holy Week, but especially on Easter Sunday as we welcome uh, thousands of our neighbors uh, here in the city to come and experience the love of God. If you want more information on that and to sign up to volunteer, if you go to our church website and do a for, I, forward slash, or we backslash, I think we're forward slash, Easter, or just find the button, you'll find it. And then on that main Easter page, one of the first things you'll see is opportunities to serve. And you just click right there, and uh, you'll see all the opportunities to serve. And uh, it would mean so much if, uh, if you would be willing to jump in somewhere, uh, let, your, uh, let your community, let your circle know about that. I'm going to read one verse out of Isaiah 43, the opening verse. And then I'm going to pray and invite Pastor Tim to come on up. Isaiah 43, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Father God, thank you so much uh, that you came to us, that you called us by name, You laid claim on our hearts uh, over the last four weeks, and then also tonight we're talking about what that cost you, uh, what it meant for you to call us by name uh, without compromising who you are as holy and just. Uh, But tonight we just, we celebrate you. We want to hear from you and learn more about you. Uh, Be with Pastor Tim as he speaks to us, and would you open our ears to hear everything you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. Would you welcome again? Your lead pastor. Thanks, Michael. Well, thank you, Michael. It is fun to do these, this uh, Lenten lecture series, and um, it's our second k- kind of shot at doing something like this, and we've made it through to the last night. How many of you have done all lectures? Come on, get your credit. Get your credit. Yeah, good job. And, uh, and it's a good turnout tonight. I thought we would be preaching this church down by, the, by this time, but you guys are, are turning out in strength to, to talk about the atonement. So we are in our last, um, our last lecture today, and I want to talk about forgiven, redeemed, and reunited. Uh, we've been talking about atonement. That's the word for, for the conversation that we've been having around the cross, atonement. And what is atonement? It is the way that God moves to keep us alive and to keep us in relationship with himself. Atonement, or or as we talked about in that first week, at one meant is a very simple way to keep it in mind. That having been separated from God, having been separated from God in our sin and subject to death, that God moved to reunite us to himself, that God brings us to at-one-ment, atonement. God unites himself to us and unites us to himself in Christ. So, where have we been? March 9th, we talked about the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, and we talked about uh, cultic or priestly sacrifice, all of the sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament. What was that foreshadowing? What was that preparing the people of God for but the perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross? March 16th, Michael was up here talking about the necessity of the cross and the gravity of sin, and when we have a hard time coming to terms with the need for the cross, we have probably not come to terms with the depth and gravity of our sin. 
and the reality of our distance from God who's holy. On the 23rd of March, I talked about the cross as a revelation of divine love, as a way of, of dis, putting on display a revelation of divine love, that the cross is an act of, 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 of disclosure from God of his true heart for us, that he, he, he loves us. Uh, and then last week, Michael talked about uh, Christ's substitutionary sacrifice, that he died in our place, didn't you? Isn't that what you talked about? Good. And uh, sometimes we call this penal substitutionary atonement, that Christ died in our place. He, he took the punishment that was ours, and he died in our place. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. But what I really want to do is, uh, is take this, this idea of atonement, and by the time we're done uh, talking, by the time I'm done talking, to have help you to get to a place where you truly understand What's my response? What am I supposed to do? Uh, it's interesting to understand, but what am I supposed to, to feel or, or respond with for what Christ has done on the cross? So again, uh, just to, to stay on this problem of atonement, what is atonement? As Charles Hodge put it, it is so that God can be just in justifying the ungodly. So that God can be just in justifying the, the ungodly. How can God be just and not punish the ungodly? God wants to justify the, the unjust, the ungodly. God wants to, to bring the ungodly into a right relationship with himself once again. He wants to restore that relationship. But how can that be just and fair? How can God be both just and justifying the ungodly? Uh, this problem is, is, I think, most uh, adequately summed up or most clearly summed up in scripture in these few verses of Romans chapter 3, 22 to 26. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone is in that ungodly category and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of, of, I get into preaching mode, of what church? <laughs> Atonement, yeah, through the shedding of his blood. So God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. How can he be both? How can he be just and fair and then not punish the sinner and then redeem or, or come back into relationship with the ungodly? How can he still be just and yet justify the, un the, uh, the ungodly? Well, it's through the atonement of Christ. It's through the sacrifice of Christ, through presenting Jesus as a sacrificial atonement, through the shedding of his blood to pay that penalty and then allow God to be both just and justifying the ungodly. To allow God to say, I, I am punishing sin, but I'm punishing it not in you, I'm punishing it in, in Jesus Christ. And once that sin is punished and has been paid for, now I can be both just and justifying the ungodly. So as we've said, um, the job of a pastor is to take difficult things and make them simple. The job of a professor is to take simple things and make them difficult, right? And we're in professor mode tonight. And so we've tried to get a bunch of five syllable words up here as much as we possibly can and, uh, and sort of spin these ideas around and get our, brains, get our brains moving. And so if you spin atonement around, you look at the four facets of it. If it's a kind of a cube, you're looking at it from four different directions. Atonement, I've talked about. Uh, there's four different kind of categories to atonement. Expiation, what's expiation? Expiation is that the penalty that was on me has been taken off of me. 
And so I, as the defendant, uh, I, I have had the fault removed from me. The fault has been removed from me. That's expiation. The guilty party is then moved from a culpable state of responsibility requiring punishment to a guiltless status. If I have been expiated of my sin, it means that the guilt of, of that sin, which requires punishment, has been removed from me. Okay, where has it been put? Well, then we talk about propitiation. Propitiation is from God's perspective. That God is, is loving and his love for us doesn't change but God is in a position as a just God of needing to punish the sinner, of needing to punish for wrongdoing. And so God has to be shifted into a propitious aspect. Uh, The wronged party, which is God, shifts from um, a a position of of needing by, by God's character by the consistency of God's character as a just and good God, of needing to punish the wrong, how can God now move to a a, a place of not needing to punish the wrong in that person? Uh, That's propitiation. The wronged party, God, shifts from a state of requiring repayment for debt to a state of peace and wholeness. No further transfer or remuneration is required to satisfy what was taken from them, propitiation. But then how about reconciliation? God's interest is not just to get to uh, we're even Stephen and now we can part ways forever status. God is actually out for relationship with us. And so God is, is, is not going to be satisfied that I've been as a sinner expiated of my guilt and that he has been propitiated of his need to punish the guilty, but God wants reconciliation. And so what's reconciliation? That's the two parties being brought together in reunion and in peace. And then intercession is required to maintain it over time. A mediator is able to stand between the two parties to maintain the communion. These are four aspects, four aspects of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So last week, Michael talked about what we call the vicarious sacrifice. Sacrifice in place of another. A vicarious sacrifice, or did you you not mention that? Did you mention that? Yeah, thank you. (laughs) So here's the point. It isn't just that Jesus died that matters. It's that Jesus died for us and in our place. That's what matters. It isn't just that Jesus died, it's that he died for us and in our place that matters. Uh, The death that Jesus suffered was a death that we justly deserved and he took in our place, in our stead, to satisfy the wrath of God. Romans 5, 9, and 10, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. So his death paid our penalty. God, by nature, moves against injustice and wrong. God, by nature and by character, moves against evil. Uh, Again, there's no sentiment, there's no sentiment within God that does not express itself in perfect action. God is is complete in that that way. There's no sort of... um, it's no sort of like, like we have a lot of uh, dis, um, disassociation between our thoughts and our actions. Like, oh, I really should have done that. I, I really meant to do that. Um, I really intended to do that that way, but then it came off in another way. Um, God isn't like that. God's character is perfectly expressed in its actions. God is complete. And so God must move against evil and injustice um, and God moves against wrong things. And that's what, God, that's what this word wrath is. So if you, if you get sort of 
uh, off on a tangent of what is this heavy word wrath? I don't like to think about God as a, a wrathful God. Wrath is a word for God's, uh, God's in consistent movement against what is wrong. Consistent movement against what is unjust, what is evil. It's that part of God, that part of God's character that must be just, punishing the wrongdoer and rewarding what is right. That's God's wrath. And it is a proper word, it's the right word to use. But the reason that we get confused about it is that we think about wrath as someone getting sort of flying off the handle, losing control of their emotions. God doesn't fly off the handle and lose control of his emotions as you might think of a wrathful a parent or a wrathful boss that you have and you think, this is horrible to, th- to think of God in this way. No, God is consistent and, and, uh, and does not fly off the handle in his wrath but God is steady on opposed to wrong, injurious, life-stealing, sinful, broken things in this fallen and confused world. And God will express his wrath. That's God's wrath. And his wrath is satisfied, this verse tells us, through the death of his son, through the death of his son. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Yep, how much more should we be reconciled, saved through his life? So Jesus died. Jesus, our debt is paid, and Jesus rose from the dead, and now we get to participate in eternal life. So tonight as I'm wrapping this up, I want to just be kind of looking back at some of these ideas that we've taken on in sort of some big theological terms, um, but bring them home a little bit. What does it benefit us that Jesus did all of this? What difference does it make for me? And how do I respond? I wanna sum up um, by walking us a little bit through the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, Restrain your enthusiasm, please. Okay, Dorothea, thank you. Um, (laughs) The Heidelberg Catechism. Has anybody spent some time with the Heidelberg Catechism? I had somebody after my second lecture um, was coming up to me and talking with me about the Heidelberg Catechism on this, and I thought, actually, this is a great way to get into this third lecture. So we're gonna run through some Heidelberg Catechism question and answers to sum this all up. The Heidelberg Catechism was a, 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 is a confession out of the Protestant Reformation. It is one of our confessions in our church's book of confessions, one of, the, one of the guiding confessions out of the Reformation that we use to shape our thinking and to keep us in stream with, uh, reformed, um, with the Reformed tradition and uh, what we believe is, a, is a, a faithful summation of scripture and a faithful way to pursue the gospel. Um, it was published in 1563 in, guess where? Heidelberg, beautiful, and uh, after the break off with the Roman Catholic Church. And when, when the Protestant Reformation happened, a lot of monks and priests moved out of the Roman Catholic Church, but what the Protestants found was that a lot of these leaders, they didn't have a deep biblical or theological education, and so they were doing their best to try to stand up and, and teach the gospel and try to teach from scriptures, but they had severe shortcomings in their doctrinal uh, just not even understanding, but, but capacity, I mean, just awareness. And so the, this catechism was written actually for pastors and elders and leaders of the church. So catechisms are written for a number of different reasons and throughout history. This one was actually written for pastors and, and elders and leaders of the church. And it's still a great summary of the gospel and the Christian faith. So. Um, on atonement, you get to something like question 12. Because we have deserved temporal and eternal punishment by the righteous judgment of God, how may we escape this punishment, come again to grace, and be reconciled to God? Answer, God wills that his righteousness be satisfied. God must be just. God wills that his righteousness be satisfied. Therefore, payment in full must be made to his righteousness either by ourselves or by another. So I think I've done something wrong, how can I escape the consequences? And in many times people think about Christianity in that vein. Oh, we've done something wrong, don't worry, God loves you so much you can escape the consequences. That's not, that's not how this happens. What, what, as Heidelberg is saying, no, God's righteousness must be satisfied, the payment must be made in full. 
Well, can we make the payment ourselves? Question 13. By no means. On the contrary, we increase our debt every day. Right? So I'm, so I'm in debt. Uh, I, I'm in debt, and every time my payment book comes, every time my, my bill comes, I've got this mortgage, and every time the, the bill comes my way, what do I do? I take out more debt, you know? Am I getting anywhere? Absolutely not. And so am I, can I pay my own debt? No, I'm increasing my debt every day. No, by no means can I pay the debt that I have amassed. Question 14, can any creature make the payment for us? I can't do it. Can the, is there anybody on the face of the earth who can do it? No one. First of all, God does not want us to punish any other creature for humanity's debt. Moreover, no creature can bear the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin and redeem others for it. So can I bring, can I bring my oxen? Can I bring my bull? Can I bring my two, two doves to the temple? Not and pay the debt. Not and pay the debt. Uh, you can you talk about all this temple sacrifice. It was real, it was effective in maintaining relationship with God, but it was not complete. All it could do was cover over the debt. And remember, as we saw in Romans 3, God left unpunished. God left unpunished the wrongs that were committed up to the time of Christ. So they were there, and the, the, you know, the debt was still there. But because of the sacrifice of animals through the temple, through the cultic sacrifice, the priestly sacrifice, that, that debt was covered over and then left unpunished to reveal the righteousness of God. That God would be forbearing in leaving that debt unpunished all of that time on the basis of the covering over of, of, this, of the sin by the blood of animal sacrifice in the temple. But that sacrifice never completed anything it just stretched that all out, you know? Like you deferred student loans. Think about that way, <laughs> you know? Glory to God for deferred student loans, you know? Can I take another master's class? Just defer that loan, whatever you can do. So, so but it was never taken care of. Never taken care of. What then, what kind of mediator and redeemer must we seek? So I can't pay it, um, the chicken can't pay it, you know, uh, the oxen can't pay it. Um, none of my, I can't, you know, ask Michael to pay it or, you know, Evie to pay it. We can't pay. It. So who can pay? What kind of a mediator and redeemer must we seek? One who is true and righteous human and yet more powerful than all creatures. That is, one who is at the same time God. Why? Why must he be true and righteous human? Because God's righteousness requires that a person who has sinned should make reparation for the sin, but the sinner cannot pay for others. Okay, so God is just. So the one who has committed the, the wrong must pay the penalty. The sinner is mankind, and the person who sinned must pay their own debt. But we're in this predicament where no one can pay that debt. No, no human being can step forward and pay that debt. There isn't anyone who isn't in the situation of being indebted, and every time they you know, move toward their debt, they increase the, the, the payment book. I mean, they just they go deeper. We go deeper as we sin, as we fall into sin, as we make uh, decisions against God's, God's, God's ways day by day by day. So no one can. There is no man or woman who has not sinned and created their own state of indebtedness. Nobody can pay. It is a debt only humanity should pay, but it is a debt no part of humanity could pay. You see that? So what does God do? Why must he be at the same time true God? Well, so that by the power of his divinity, he might bear in a human the burden of God's wrath and recover for us and restore to us righteousness and life. So he's gotta be, he's gotta be fully human because only a human can pay the debt. But he's gonna need to be divine because no human you know, would have the power to endure the wrath of God and carry on forward. 
And so that's, this is how Heidelberg comes into the um, Christology of the, uh, how is Jesus fully man and fully human? In fact, why does Jesus need to be fully man and f um, fully God, fully human and fully God, um, full humanity, full divinity in one and the same person? Who is this mediator who is at the same time true God and a true and perfectly righteous human? Who is it? Yeah, the answer is always Jesus, right? Sunday school. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is freely given to us for complete redemption and righteousness. It's a debt only a man should pay, a person should pay, but only the Son of God could pay. Okay, so later the catechism is running through the Apostles' Creed. And a lot of these catechisms do that. They, they start to run through the Apostles' Creed. So we come to the word suffered in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. And question 37 asks, what do you understand by the word suffered? Answer, that throughout his life on earth, but especially at the end of it, he bore in body and soul the wrath of God against sin of the whole human race. Now that's, that's an interesting idea. Because what we begin to look at here is that uh, Jesus actually started to take this debt on in the incarnation. That's, what, that's really what this is saying, is that, that, that actually Jesus started to, to suffer as soon as he, as it says in Philippians 2, emptied himself and became a human being. And so the, the suffering, actually, we think of the suffering just as that very last chapter when he's arrested and beaten and crucified. But, the, but from the perspective of being the, the divine son of God, the second person of the Trinity, living in the eternal kingdom, the suffering really begins at, at, yeah, in the, uh, at conception and in, 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 the, in the cradle, I mean, in taking on flesh. Um, so by his suffering, as the only expiatory, does anybody know what that word means? A sacrifice, he redeems our body and soul from everlasting damnation. He obtained for us God's grace, righteousness, and eternal life. The suffering was not just what happened at Passion Week in Jerusalem, the whole incarnation is part of God the Son suffering for our salvation. I'll tell you just another thing, off notes on that. Um, so uh, does, has Jesus suffered all the ills and temptations of, of a human being? Yes, um, but Jesus only lived to age 30, 33, right. Um, so a lot of us are older than that, you know? I mean, it's, you know, some of you are, I guess. Um, so does he know what it's like to be, you know, in older age, in middle age, and in older age, um, and you're saying yes? And how does he know? He's all knowing, sure. So he, but it, but even in uh, so church fathers and theologians have sort of looked at this and said, okay, um, Jesus actually he declined into a state of total loss of his physical capabilities in his Passion Week, and he he went into a, a state where his body was in weakness, uh, where his body was um, experiencing the the ills that uh, that we associate with the decline of capability through uh, declining into older age. And I just think that's kind of interesting. But the point that, the real point that's, that's to be made is that Jesus in the incarnation took on all of what it is to be a human being. From birth through puberty, you know, Lord help us. Through uh, uh, that ascendancy out of adolescence and into adulthood and uh, through to the, the last breath um, Jesus experienced it all. And in every moment and in every instance, he never sinned. He never sinned. And you look back on your life and you think about the different types of sin that attach to different seasons of your life and the different ways that the devil comes at you and tempts you in different seasons of your life. And, um, and, and you can take confidence that Christ has navigated all of them and he never sinned. So whatever we face of temptation, Christ faced it. He, he knows that, and he never sinned. He lived a perfect life, a perfect life. So, 
question 38, why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as his judge? Answer, so that Jesus would be condemned by an earthly judge even though he was innocent, he thereby set us free from the judgment of God which in all its severity ought to fall upon us. So what happened? Jesus took on a judgment that was not his own. He was innocent but a judge declared him guilty. And so there's this actual playing out of, of, um, of penal substitutionary atonement, of, of Jesus not just dying or not just being punished or not just being put hard upon by the evils of the world, but being pronounced guilty and then being uh, sentenced. And by a human power even, but in that human power, Pontius Pilate, is this, this rendering of judgment. So Jesus takes on an actual car- charge that he does not own. It's not, it's not a charge that he, that he earned by his own deeds. He lived a perfect life all the way through. And now he's judged guilty. And that judgment of guilt is now uh, our guilt that is coming upon him. As we are expiated of our sins, our sins are placed on Jesus Christ. They're placed on him as he is, as he is pronounced guilty even through the, the lips of a jerk like Pontius Pilate. Excuse me, there's kids in the room. Yeah. But that's a fair, it's a fair assessment. Question 39, what is unique about Jesus' death by crucifixion? Why did he die on a cross? Question, but I answer by this, I am assured that he took upon himself the curse which lay upon me, you see, a vicarious sacrifice, because the death of the cross was cursed by God. So this is an interesting point. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So Jesus, by, by dying in that manner, there's a lot of different, you know, reasons as we explore it of, of why Jesus died on the cross like this. But uh, as he died on the cross, uh, it would be very clear to see that he is dying in a manner that is cursed under Deuteronomic law. It's cursed under Hebrew law and everybody knows that. So if someone was, even in that ancient world, if someone was crucified, it was assumed that they must be cursed by God. Not just that they, super, they got in big trouble with the Romans, but to have died in such a manner was to assume that this person must have been cursed by God. And so a curse has come on Christ uh, in a, from a divine perspective. Jesus became cursed. He bore in his flesh the sins of all humanity and he died under a curse, under the curse of God's wrath. Question 40, why did Christ have to suffer death because the righteousness and truth of God are such that nothing else could make reparation for our sins except the, the death of the Son of God. Uh, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, his Son. Um, okay, death. Why was he buried? To, to confirm that he was really dead. I like that one. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, that's off color, <laughs> but there are just these moments like, well, yeah. Um, now, he was confirmed to be really dead through the piercing, through, um, uh, as you recall, they, there's, no, there's no possibility that Christ physically, that Jesus physically swooned into some kind of, um, you know, passing out and then recovered in the coolness of the tomb. It's absolutely outlandish. If there was anybody that knew how to, to bring someone um, to death, it was the Roman guard, and that was their number one job. And they were very careful about it, and they would come along and, and uh, break the legs of anyone who you know, was still finding the strength to pull up and breathe, because that's what you have to do when you're crucified. You have to pull up to get uh, enough room in your lungs to pull air into your lungs. And they would break the legs, which you couldn't do that anymore. And when they came to Jesus, they didn't break the legs because they said he's already dead and they pierced him in the side and outflowed from him a mixture of water and blood. And that's what happens when you die and all of your, um, your internal organs, they, they no longer separate the blood from the fluid that's in your body. And so it's very, very clear that, um, that Jesus uh, was really dead. Since Christ died for us, why must we also die? Well, our death is not reparation for our sins, 
but only a dying to sin and an entering into eternal life. What further benefit do we receive from the sacrifice and death of Christ on the cross? Okay. Uh, how does it benefit me? That by his power our old self is crucified, put to death and buried with him, so that the evil passions of our physical bodies may reign in us no more, but that we may offer ourselves to him as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about in our Redeem series on Sunday mornings. Why is there added he descended into hell? Have you ever wondered about that? Um, I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah, what do, you, what do you mean? And it's a great debate. It's a great discussion. There's lots of scripture to study on that. None of it will, will give you a perfectly clear aspect. Um, but Heidelberg's answer is, is, in my view, about the best you can give. In my severest tribulations, I may be assured that Christ my Lord has redeemed me from hellish anxieties and torment by the unspeakable anguish, pains, and terrors which he suffered in his soul both on the cross and before. What does it mean that he went down uh, ad infernos to the, to the, to the hell place? Um, it means that he went, everything that it means to be dead, Jesus experienced. There's, no, there's no, nothing about death that Jesus left untouched. Jesus went as low as you can go in death. And from there he rose again from the dead. So that's what Jesus did. What are the benefits? What are the benefits? Well, number one, we are forgiven. Our sin is taken away. Not just covered over like before the cross where uh, God is demonstrating his righteousness through forbearance of not, not demanding the, the immediate payment of the debt that's sitting there, but that sin is actually taken away, removed. The penalty for our sins is taken by another and we can be forgiven. Psalms 103, eight to 12, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. This is, this is long before Christ. And yet this character of God is coming through, that something's coming that's gonna be different from what we're doing even at the temple. He does not treat us at our, as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. We can be forgiven. Number two, we are redeemed. Have you heard anything about that lately? Um, a purchase price has been paid. And now you're not your own, you've been bought with a price. But that purchase price has set you free from a host of different types of bondage. A host of different types of bondage. Bondage to sin, bondage to the, the claims of the devil, your accuser, who if you're in your sin has this right to accuse you of being separated from God and disobedient in your sin from your bondage to death where you are bound to pay the penalty of your sins through, through eternal death, not just physical death, which is a, now just a way to transfer into the eternal life of, of Christ's kingdom, but through eternal death, eternal separation from God for the wages of sin is death. You're freed from all of that because you've been Redeemed. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, Mark 10, 45, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a payment, a ransom. You're stuck, but I'm gonna make a payment to get you out of where you're stuck. You're, you've been kidnapped, you've been uh, imprisoned. I'm gonna pay the price to get you out. I'm gonna pay a ransom, a ransom for many. Number three, so we're redeemed, we're forgiven, we're redeemed. Number three, we are reunited. Remember, God did not just want the debt paid and then to depart, never to speak to one another again. God wanted relationship. That's the whole, that's the whole point. God wants intimacy. God wants uh, relationship, communion with us. What God wants is not to make us right. He wants to make us family. He wants to bring us into his family, to name us 
children of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Brought into the family. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we should be like him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those are the benefits. Our response, in light of all this, what should we, how should you and I respond? From a position of, of a, a fallen sinner, how should I respond? Well, I'm gonna give you a few things. First, if the cross is a needed sacrifice to remove the guilt of your sin, respond by celebrating that freedom. Do not run again into your previous pattern of sin. This is what we call cheap grace. But repent, turn in your heart, and take on a new life. And for me, that's, that's an every morning you know, recurrence. Uh, 9, 10, noon, 3.30, 5. Because yeah. by that time, it's time to repent again. And I'm gonna turn again. I'm gonna turn again. I'm gonna turn again. Never give up on that. Because Christ has bought this for you. If the cross was a needed sacrifice to remove the guilt of your sin, respond by celebrating that freedom and don't run back again into that pattern. And every time you do, celebrate that freedom again and repent and take on new life in the power of the Spirit. If the cross, second, if the cross was a necessary sacrifice to gain your forgiveness, respond by being forgiven. Be forgiven. One of the greatest crimes of Christianity is to remain in our guilt when Jesus has pronounced our forgiveness. Now when you do that, which is like a, a prisoner who is in the, the cell and the bars have been pulled off and the, the, the door has been yanked off the hinges and, and everything is all opened up and what does the prisoner do? Just stays put, you know. I just don't believe that I'm really supposed to, to move out into my freedom. I, I just don't believe that someone really paid the, the, pr the price for me, that I'm really forgiven. You sit there in your cell, even though the cell has been opened up. That's what that's like. Um, but it's, it's actually even worse than that. And I want you to think about this. Um, I'm gonna make you feel really guilty for... <laughs> For, for feeling really guilty, okay? <laughs> Listen, when we refuse to accept the forgiveness Jesus has won on the cross for us, we refuse to accept it in our mind, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, we don't take it on. We, we say, well, I know, I'm forgiven, okay. But I don't really believe it, you know? When we do that, we're doing two things. One, we're making the claim that we don't really believe he accomplished what he says he did on the cross. I don't really believe you, Jesus. I don't believe your blood was effective for the forgiveness of my sins. So we're, if, we, if we don't accept forgiveness and receive the forgiveness won for us, we are mounting up in the face of Jesus and saying, I don't really believe that what you did on the cross was effective to forgive my sins. And number two, it's even worse than that. If you refuse to accept the forgiveness that Christ has won for you, you are claiming that your own authority as judge and jury supersedes Christ's authority. You say I'm forgiven, but I don't. I say I'm still guilty. Well, I'm the... I mean, check my name tag, right? I'm the Savior and Lord and Son of God. Like, I'm the judge. I do get to say, 
And when we fail to receive that forgiveness, we're, we're saying, Jesus, A, I don't, down here I don't really believe that, that what you did on the cross was effective for the forgiveness of my sins. And B, um, I'll really take this, I'll take this in my own hands. I'll decide if I'm still guilty. Do you understand? If the cross was a necessary sacrifice to gain your forgiveness, be forgiven and live forgiven. Third, if the cross was an act of supernatural and divine love, receive that love and respond with, guess what? Love. Remember when I surveyed the wondrous cross, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Love demands my soul, my life, my all. Respond with love to the love that Christ has put on display in dying for you. Uh, Fourth, If the cross was a reversal of power, and this is one of the areas that we have not, we did not deeply delve into in our lecture series, but if the cross was a reversal of power, then live in that cruciform pattern of the kingdom. What do I mean? How did Jesus win the victory? Everybody expected on Palm Sunday for the Messiah to come in on a mighty steed, draw his sword, and drive the Romans out. He's going to draw his sword, and he is going to cut down all the sinners. Now, first of all, if Jesus rode in and cut down all the sinners, (laughs) that's it, you know, that's it. But that's, Jesus is going to come in, he's going to drive out all the unrighteous. Um, I mean, again. So Jesus is going to come in and drive the Romans out of Jerusalem, thus saving the people of God. Little did they know what God intended salvation to really mean for us. And little did anyone know or guess that the Messiah would hobble in on a donkey, you know, dragging his... his, uh, his toes, the donkey would be so small, a colt of a donkey, you know, just kind of dragging his toes in on this little donkey. Um, And he would hobble in on a donkey, immediately get arrested, be beaten, dragged off, and crucified. That's not the picture of the Messiah they had. How did Jesus win the victory? Jesus went low to go high. Jesus went weak to destroy and to shame the strong. We're tempted always to go back to the world's pattern and think that we must defeat strength with greater strength. Jesus asks us to follow him. Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He said that before they saw him carry a cross. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And then in Philippians uh, 2.5, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. And it goes on to describe how he stepped down out of heaven, he took on vulnerability, and he suffered humiliation unto death, even death on a cross. And therefore, his name is exalted above every name. And at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So this is saying uh, imitate that mental posture, that mindset of Jesus. We can't repeat what Jesus did, but we're called to follow in his way if we are in Christ. And I brought a book in um, tonight called Strong and Weak by someone named Andy Crouch. And um, Andy was here uh, with us in 2016 and uh, did a wonderful weekend with us on culture making and helped us to shape our seventh value, make beauty, as our, our position of how we stand as, as, uh, as Christians trying to demonstrate something different to our culture, that we, uh, we make beauty in the name of the Lord, we make beautiful things. And, and, um, uh, and uh, he, he made a little video saying, hey, I love that you guys did that seventh value, if you remember that at uh, Vision Weekend. That was all right before uh, COVID, so I'm sure you don't remember anything about that. Like I don't. But he wrote a beautiful book called Strong and Weak. 
And uh, Andy says, we want very much to continue in the way of authority, in the way of authority with no vulnerability. What we really want is to be somewhere where we, we have all the authority and no vulnerability, no woundableness. Vulnerability, literally from the Latin, means woundableness. And so we don't want to be woundable. We don't want to be vulnerable. We want to have all the authority. And that way, we can escape pain. Well, it doesn't work that way in this life. There's no place that's apart from pain. Uh, we were just talking about this earlier, but actually, that's one of his interesting things is uh, that, that that desire to be in full authority and no vulnerability is what pushes us online. It pushes us online. Because when you get into the digital world, you feel like you've got great power. Even as, I grew up playing a lot of video games as a kid, you know, and you think, well, oh, I'm going up against, you know, this, well, then I die. Well, there's another life, do, 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 you know. And you just keep on going. You're, you're not really vulnerable. You've got all the power, no vulnerability. And it pushes us online. And the next book that he wrote was all about how addicted we are to the online world and how addicted our children are. But we want that place where we are, uh, where, where, we're, where we've got all the power and none of the vulnerability. We've got all the authority and, uh, and no pain. And the surprising thing is, is that there's so much life to be lived on the other side of, of being humble and, and of opening ourselves up to places of vulnerability and weakness. Uh, why continue to track, uh, why continue in the track of influence through greater power and force when Jesus showed us the way of humiliation and exaltation? So um, I'll be talking about this on Sunday, but um, from the from the catechisms on, uh, the life of Christ has been separated into two categories, his humiliation and his exaltation. And his humiliation is everything in taking on flesh and emptying himself and becoming a man, even humbling himself to death, even death on a cross and going all the way down into death. That's all humiliation. And then from there, all the way up to resurrection, um, revealing himself to his to his friends, to his disciples, over 500, and ascension. That's his exaltation. Humiliation and exaltation. Jesus didn't go from exaltation to greater exaltation, and he didn't, he didn't come into the world to drop a sword on all the unrighteous. He went this way of going down and weak and being vulnerable and going all the way to the cross. And in that, the power of God created the victory and the exaltation. So it's a lot to think about that um, at another time we could do more on that. But, um, but if the cross is a power flip, if the most powerful thing that happened in the world is that a man died on a cross, then we've gotta think about power differently, don't we? And so in some way, we've got to think in the mindset of Jesus Christ, as Philippians 2 said, and think, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna navigate this world simply by conquering everything around me. Um, I'm gonna need to follow in a faithfulness that allows weakness and vulnerability and trusts in the power of God to bring exaltation after humiliation. Okay, well, so we come to an end. We come to an end. You ready for the end? There is no more central symbol of Christianity than the cross. So I can't, I can't imagine anything more important to understand than what Jesus did for you on the cross. Paul declared the cross the very core of the gospel. The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they spend a third of their time on the Passion Week and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. You've got a story of the life of Jesus and a third of that biography is spent on the last week his death. Jesus went to the cross as an act of supreme love and personal sacrifice. Jesus went to the cross to free us from obligations to dark powers like sin, death, and even Satan. Jesus went to the cross to show us that 
real power goes low to serve, not high to dominate. Jesus went to the cross to open up a threshold to new life, to show us the totality of what it means to follow him. The old dies and the new comes in. But above all and through it all, we must never forget, Jesus went to the cross for us, on our behalf, in our place. He went to replace us, to displace us from a position, a death, that we deserved. The place on the cross was ours, and Christ took our place so that we could take his. And it wasn't an angry father appeasing, appeased by watching his own son die. That's a false understanding. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all cooperated and contrived to bring salvation to a rotten and disobedient humanity and to a rotting and corrupted creation through this loving, necessary, painful, selfless, open, vulnerable, humiliating, substitutionary, atoning sacrifice for our sins. He did it for us. As the Nicene Creed says, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified. For us, for our sake. That's why we preach Christ crucified. That's why our message is the cross. He did it for us. What do we now find at the cross? Why are we so fascinated? We find all we need. And I'll leave you with this quote from John Calvin. If we seek redemption, it will be found in his passion. If absolution, in his condemnation. If remission of the curse, in his cross. Satisfaction, in his sacrifice. Purification, in his blood. Reconciliation, in his descent into hell. Why? Because if he, if, he, if he truly descended into hell, there's no place that we can wind up or be that we're separated from where he can get us home. You, you know, Jesus can get you home from there. I'm not talking about, okay, that sounds like I'm saying that once you're in hell, you can get out of hell. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about how Jesus has covered the full range of, of human existence. And uh, so reconciliation in his descent into hell, mortification of the flesh in his tomb, newness of life and immortality in his resurrection, the inheritance of the celestial kingdom in his entrance into heaven. We are in him, he's the first fruits. As he's gone into heaven, he is the forerunner of our faith, we're following after him. Protection, security, abundance, and enjoyment of all blessings in his kingdom. A fearless expectation of the judgment in the judicial authority committed to him. Who's in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ lives and reigns in heaven for us. Finally, blessings of every kind are deposited in him. Let us draw from his treasury and no other source until our desires are satisfied. So friends, however much you have thought about the cross, you have only scratched the surface. However much you've thought about the cross, you have only scratched the surface. Commit to keep learning as you expose layer after layer. And I don't know of all that you've heard what what helps you come home to the cross the most but there's so many different facets, so many different angles, so many different ways to approach the cross of Calvary. There's, if it's not hitting you, keep, keep after those layers, those facets, until you feel it come home. Whatever you're looking for, we find it all at the cross of Jesus Christ.